How's it going, folks? Welcome to another sort of test pilot for this podcast I'm going to be starting up in the fall right around the time of our 10th anniversary, and that is the Reviewing Network Live. If you haven't seen the previous test pilot I did for the Recap of the Academy Awards, I'll put a link to it in the corner so you can go ahead and check that out. Uh, what this basically is going to be is a weekly stream of consciousness conversation show talking about the latest entertainment news, movies and TV shows of the week, other stories of noteworthiness to talk about, and... Uh, this is basically what this is going to be. I'm going to try to put these up every Sunday night, so um, we'll see how this works. But uh, we're you're still going to get a couple of these test pilots before we actually launch in the fall. So before we get to the – but uh, uh, enough of that, though. Let's get to the topic of discussion that I have for this particular episode. And uh, we're close to the summer movie season. 2023 summer movie season is going to be coming up. Basically, two weeks from now, it's going to launch with um, the Guardians of the Galaxy 3, and then we're off and running at that point. It's amazing how 2023 is basically moving as fast as it is, and throughout the course of this particular show that I'm doing right now, I'm going to be talking about the summer movies in general, the ones I'm looking forward to, the ones of most notable worthiness to talk about. Um, you're going to be surprised with some of the picks of movies that I'm not looking forward to, and maybe you'll be surprised at some of the ones that I am looking forward to, but I'm going to be doing this to talk about um, the movies overall of, tw of the 2023 summer season that um, I'm most looking forward to. I'm going to look for through Ju uh, May, June, July, and August, so uh, we got a lot to cover here, so let's not waste any more time. Let us jump into it, and we're going to start off with the first new movie of the summer, which is going to be, as the as I said before, the previously mentioned Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3. So Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3 marks the end of James Gunn's tenure at, MC, at the MCU. Uh, he eventually goes on to DC to try to reignite the Superman series, as well as DC in general, with their cinematic universe. And so there is a lot of excitement for this movie in particular, even though the MCU right now is kind of in troubling times right now. I said I did a post a couple of weeks ago on the website talking about how uh, the Marvel Cinematic Universe is kind of in a in a cautionary position right now. Basically, I think the COVID pandemic really kind of spurred the MCU's success factor because since we got since the COVID pandemic, there's been more misses in the MCU than there've been hits. Like um, uh, Spider-Man: No Way Home is a great film. Black Panther: Wakanda Forever is a great film. Everything else in there has been kind of hit and miss. Some of them have been decent, but most of them have been nowhere near as good as what they had been doing before the pandemic. I don't know if that is. I don't know if it was because I don't know what is what's going on there. But I think you can definitely tell that there is a lot of concern about what's going on in the MCU now because of kind of the slow start that Phase Five is on in right now with Quantum Mania not being the big hit they wanted to. They just fired Victor Alonso, their longtime executive producer at MC at the MCU. And then, of course, you have the controversy going on with Jonathan Majors, who's supposed to be the big part of this new series of films coming up with him playing Kane the Conqueror. And now there's a pretty good chance that if these accusations end up being true about his domestic abuse that he did, he may be out pretty soon. We don't know what's going to happen now, but um, it's definitely something to keep a close eye on. And it really puts the MCU in this unique spotlight that they haven't really been in before. They really need to figure out a way to kind of change things around a little bit, but Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3 could be one of those things where it could help ease the t ease the pain a little bit because I think a lot of people really are expecting this to be very good. They are expecting a lot more because this is the last chapter of this series and these characters that we've come to know and love, and this is James Gunn's swan song from the MCU. And everything from the Guardians of the Galaxy series has been a lot of fun. The movies are great. The holiday special they did for Disney Plus last year was really good. Even some of the animated series that I saw on Disney XD has been very solid as well. They've done so much with these characters overall. They're just so much fun to watch. These movies have so many great memorable moments to them. It's just going to be amazing to see how they will find a way to end this. Because I'm, really I'm really curious to see how they'll go out on top on this. Like, if they go out on top of this... This could be easily one of the best trilogies in the MCU easily. And I'd say Spider-Man, the Tom Holland Spider-Man movies are currently in the top position right now, but we don't know if there's going to be... As I'm pretty sure they're making another one, Sp another F Spider-Man movie after this. Uh, I'm not entirely sure, though, but I think that is going to happen. I think I did hear that they were cons that it's pretty much going forward that there's going to be another film in that series. So if this movie, Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3, ends on a positive note, this will be one of the best trilogies we've had in a long time. I mean, 
The first two movies were really good. Everything about this universe and these characters is so much fun to watch. And I'm really excited to see what they're going to do to wrap this up. It, the trailers have been looking very solid all around. It's been a good mix of comedy and more dramatic moments in here. It looks like we're going to go into some deep backstories. I just hope they find a way to end this series on the right note. I'm hoping that there's going to be a ton to, of excitement in this movie, a ton of things to really look forward to in this. I'm definitely looking forward to this one. This is definitely one of the big new movies of the summer that I'm really looking forward to checking out. So that's Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3. So after that, on May 12th, we kind of get these lo lower movies, not movies that aren't really as big as some of the other blockbusters we're going to be looking at. That is, of course, if you're looking forward to, unless you're, of course, you're looking forward to the amazing sequel to The Book Club, The Book Club, The Next Chapter, which I just saw the trailer for it yesterday during Super Mario Brothers, and I gotta say, man, uh, it doesn't look 80 for Brady Bad, but, man, there was no reason why you had to put that trailer for Book Club 2 on the Super Mario Brothers movie, and you could put so many other trailers on there, like, the next movie we're gonna be talking about here, which is Fast X, Fast and Furious 10, uh, the second to last movie in the series, supposedly, because technically this was supposed to be the last movie in the series, but they said, you know what, we're going to continue it anyway because you keep making us money even though these movies keep getting more ridiculous and more stupider as they go along. This is somebody who has been really a fan of the Fast and Furious films for a good period of time. Like, I thought once they brought everybody back for the fourth movie and they did four, five, six, and seven... Those were, were the best times for the Fast and Furious series, but after that, it goes downhill pretty fast. Like, Fe uh, uh, Fate of the Furious was the one that really broke me, and it was mostly because of the addition of Charlize Theron, who plays um, Cypher, and once she came into the picture, it was just like, like one of the most bland, monotone characters ever, and I'm sorry, man. Like, at that point, that was my jumping-off point. Like, it was just like... She, like, Charlize Theron is a great actress. She's a great action star, too. We've seen her in great movies. Like, we've seen her in great action films, like Atomic Blonde and Eon Flux, which is, very under, which is not a great film overall, but she played the character of Eon Flux pretty well in that movie, at least in my opinion. But, um, but man, in this movie, she just has one look the entire movie, just staring blankly at the camera and talking in this soft, monotone voice. It's just like, that doesn't make you a good villain. I'm sorry, that does not make you a good villain that you just have that one look and one way to speak to people, and it's just like, it just gets really annoying, and the fact that they keep bringing her back for these, they keep bringing her back, she was in F9, she was one of the worst things about that movie, and then, guess what, she's gonna be in this one too, and she seems even more, and she gets more annoying with every single movie she's in, it's just like, I cannot take this person anymore, like, Fate of the Furious was the worst one the series kind of redeemed itself a little bit with F9, but it was just barely passable. And Fast X just looks like a movie that's just running, literally running out of fume, fuel left. Like, there's just nothing about this movie that is just, that looks worth it. I mean, yeah, Jason Momoa can be pretty awesome when you put him in something like Aquaman or some of these other action movies, but he just looks like he's playing a bland, bland villain in this movie. Like, he's just a one... It's kind of like with Cypher. He's just like a one-note villain who really has no real purpose in this movie except to just be the bad guy. Like, John Cena in the last movie is back in here as well. Jason Statham is back as well. Of course, Wayne Johnson isn't back because he and Vin Diesel butted heads. But you know what? Vin Diesel, he made a better move in The Fate of the Furious. Him and Jason Statham, Hobbs and Shaw, was a really good, fun action movie that literally did everything that made the Fast and Furious movie so good. And I thought that was a ton of fun overall. overall. Hobson Shaw I thought was a really good film. Since Furious 7, these movies in the regular series just keep getting more ridiculous and more stupider with every film. And honestly, I'm just not looking forward to this next these next two movies, honestly. I'm just bur burned down on the Fast and Furious movies. I don't care if you got a new director in Louis Letier who did The Incredible Hulk, the Edward Norton one. I'm just really done with this series. There's nothing that they can do in this series, story-wise, that would really convince me that this is going to be something be worth it, but who? But really, you're not going into this in the story. You're here to see the cars. You're here to see the vi the way they go completely over the top with the action sequences, which could be fun, honestly, but they're just getting more and more ridiculous. They're putting Jason Momoa's character into scenes from the previous series that have nothing to do with the action... Is that had nothing to do with this character. Like, he just shows up for no reason whatsoever, and it's just like... Like... 
I'm just bummed down on these movies. And they're going back. They're like highlighting stuff from the previous movies. They're tr apparently they're going back to what the original Fast and Furious movie was, the, basically about car racing and all that. And supposedly Paul Walker is back in this movie, even though he's been dead for ten years now. Yeah, ten. Is, is it ten years or? Yeah, ten years now, because it happened in late November 2013, and the series ended ended his story very w well in Furious 7, but nope, they're going to find a way to bring him back, because nobody is really dead in these movies, and that's apparently a reason why we have to keep keep beating the dead horse on this. Like, I know people are going to go see this movie regardless, I know it's going to be a big hit regardless, because because they're just they just love the style of these movies, and the way these movies just go gone so crazy, but you know what? The Jurassic World movies did that too, and you people got on me and everyone else who really liked those movies because of that. I know the Jurassic World mo movies are not that good, but you know what? I will gladly take them over the two Jurassic Park sequels any day of the week. It's any day of the week I will take the Jurassic. I will take Fallen Kingdom and Dominion over the Lost World and Jurassic Park Three. That's just my personal opinion, but but uh, bottom line, why don't we even bring up Jurassic World? For all we know that. This, this series will eventually cross over with Jurassic Park. I mean, why not do that? I mean, why not just do Fast and Furious meets Jurassic World for the next movie? I mean, you pretty much have gone as crazy as you can get. Just keep going for it, man. Like, But, um, yeah, but overall, Fast X is just something that I'm not looking forward to seeing. I'm, I am going to see it eventually for some content here, but I'm really not going into it with a lot of high expectations. And these movies are getting way too expensive at this point to even make profit. This new one, I think, is going to be around close to $350, $400 million in budget to make. So this movie needs to make a ton of money to even keep the series afloat. And it's the seventh most expensive film ever made right now. So, uh, yeah, that's this, this movie needs to make a lot of money, which it probably will. And I, and I say I'm not going to see... I'm not really interested in seeing it, but I'm going to see it anyway, just for some content. But I'm definitely not going into it with the best of expectations. And some of you may say, well, that hurts your opinion of the movie overall. It's just like, you shouldn't have to do that, man. Just It's just, I don't know. Like these, this, I'm going to stick it out for these last two movies, but I'm going into it with as low expectations as I can. So that's Fast X for you. That opens up on May 19th. So not too long after Fast X comes out on May 26th, we have... Disney's latest live-action adaptation, and that is The Little Mermaid. This is directed by Rob Marshall of Chicago, Nine, and also Mary Poppins Returns fame. David McGee, who also wrote Life of Pi, also wrote Mary Poppins Returns. And this is, a, like I said, it's a remake, it's a, a live-action adaptation of the 1989 movie that really turned the studio around when their animation studio was de was near dead in the water. This was the Renaissance, this was the start of the Renaissance period. The Little Mermaid itself, the movie still holds up today. I mean, I just watched it again recently. It's a movie that still holds up after all these years. So, with this movie, this live action adaptation, you know, I've been the biggest defender of these live action adaptations since they came out, like all the way in the beginning. But slowly but surely, I've turned my back on them. I think Pinocchio was the point where I just said I can't keep doing this to myself anymore. The Robert Zemeckis Pinocchio film is terrible, and this movie in particular has me has me very with a very mixed opinion on it. There are elements in here that I do think work. I like Haley Halle Bailey playing Ariel. I think she's going to be the least of the film's problems because she's clearly fit perfect for this role. Like she she looks very good good playing Ariel, but she also has a good singing voice as it see, we see in the trailers for this. And so I think she's going to be the best thing about this movie overall. You also have um, uh, David Diggs as Sebastian and Jacob Tremblay, who are really good actors, playing Flounder, and Aquafina as Scuttle. And I gotta say, Scuttle looks pretty good. Sebastian and Flounder look absolutely horrible. Like, Sebastian literally looks like what Mr. Krabs looks like when he goes on shore in Bikini Bottom on SpongeBob SquarePants. And Flounder, Flounder just really looks like a generic-ass fish. I mean... There's just nothing about those designs that are unique or creative compared to what the original film did. I mean, I mean, it's just I don't understand what they were thinking with those designs overall. Uh, some of the other casting isn't too bad. I like Javier Bardem playing King Triton, but Melissa McCarthy as Ursula I actually think doesn't look that bad. I know the the first trailer that came out where we actually see the first look at her looked a little looked a little not that great, but as but with the last trailer that came out. I mean, I think she could make it work. I think she could make it work overall. 
But uh, like I said before, nothing's going to top the original film, and I really have a lot of concerns going into this one here. Uh, a lot of things that I'm excited about. Alan Macon's coming back to do the songs for this. You got Lin-Manuel Miranda writing new songs for the remake. But uh, the thing that really bugs me is that it's going to be over two and a half hours long, or close to two and a half hours long, about two hours, 15 minutes. The original movie was only an hour and a half, and really, we just saw it with the Super Mario Brothers movie. That's enough time to really get a, a lot of enjoyment factor out of a movie. It does not need to be over two hours long because they're going to drag stuff a lot. They're going to drag stuff a lot. There are going to be some pointless storylines that get thrown in here. And that's the one thing I'm really worried about with this movie. It's just going to feel like a lifeless remake. It's going to feel like Pinocchio. It's going to feel like some of the worst live-action adaptations that Disney has done. done. They add all this pointless stuff here that serves no purpose to the story whatsoever. But it's just there to fill the time up. And it's just like... A part of me just feels like that this movie could go either way. More than likely, it's going to fall into the category of the Disney live-action remakes that are just overblown. They pad stuff out too long and they don't do anything different compared to the previous film. But um, sometimes it does work. You get something like a Cinderella or a Jungle Book or a movie of that caliber... But then you have a Pinocchio, and then you have a Dumbo, and then you have a Lion King where they do things that are things that could be different, but they don't really put a lot of time and effort to actually make something that made the original movie so special. I mean, they're basically just cover songs, honestly, but really bad cover songs. If the original Little Mermaid was Blue Dabadi Babadai, the song by Eiffel 65, then this new remake could end up becoming like the terrible remake of that song. Uh, seriously, go look for that remake for the song here, and it's it's a butchering of that song. It's a butchering of that song overall, and that's what I feel like this movie could end up be going into dangerous territory with. But then again, maybe it's one of those big surprises. I mean, Rob Marshall is a very good director. He's made a lot of very good films. Uh, some underrated gems, I mean, I still like Nine. I still think that's a great musical. I like Memoirs of a Geisha. Chicago's probably his magnum opus. Um... So I'm going on that. I'm going on the. I'm giving it the benefit of a doubt because of the talent that they have on here, but I am going in with trepidations. It could be a mixed bag. It could go one way. It could go with the other. There, we'll have to see what happens when it opens on Memorial Day weekend. Next up, we probably have my biggest, most anticipated movie of the summer, and that is, of course, Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse, a sequel to one of my favorite movies of all time, Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse, the film that won an Academy Award for Best Animated Feature. It was a great Spider-Man movie overall with Miles Morales, uh, Gwen Stacy, and all is and all the different Spider-Men that they have in there. And now this is just taking it to a whole nother level. It looks like they're expanding the story to these insane levels that look so that look like they're heading in the right direction here. Uh, they're adding all these new elements, these new characters in here. You've got characters like Spider Woman, Spider Punk, Spider Man India, the spot in this movie. Just a whole assortment of characters in here. It's going to be very interesting to see what they do to kind of connect this to the other Spider Man franchises, not just the animated movies, but I think they're going to try to bring in the live action elements, for the live action characters too, because they even mentioned it in this last trailer that they did. Plus, Oscar Isaac as Spider Man 2099. That's perfect casting right there as we saw in the end of Into, uh, Into the Spider-Verse, I'm really excited to see what they're going to do. I like that they're also expanding the story of Miles Morales and his relationship with his family, especially his mother, who's been a, around a lot of the trailers for this movie. You're seeing a lot more, you're hearing a lot more of her character getting an expansion in these new trailers that have been coming out. And I'm really excited to see where they go from here. The first movie was such a great, great film and they bring in some really good directors to do this new one. Joaquin DeSantos, who'd done Avatar, The Last Airbender, as well as The Legend of Korra, and all these other great animated shows. Kemp Powers, who did Soap. He wrote One Night in Miami. Great underrated film directed by Regina King. There's just so many elements in here that I'm really looking forward to seeing. And the animation, once again, fantastic. The animation looks incredible. This is easily the most anticipated movie of the summer for me. Maybe the most anticipated movie coming out the rest of this year. And really, I cannot wait to see where they go from here. I can't wait to see what this new Spider-Verse brings us with this. And then we have another film coming out next year to wrap, the to wrap this story up. I'm really excited to see what they do here. I can't wait to see this movie. Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse comes out on June 2nd. As well as The Boogeyman, which has my interest mostly because of the marketing that 20th Century Fox and Disney... or 20th Century Studios and Disney is putting into it. I mean, they put the trailer on during the NFC Championship game, which usually when they do that, 
they really do believe in a movie, and I think that this movie could be very interesting. It's based off of a novel by Stephen King, and uh, the trailers for this have look very, very creepy. Like, it looks like it could be something that could be pretty fun, so... Uh, I'm definitely looking forward to see what that could be like. I mean, you put a, you put the trailer during a, the big NFC Championship game, which usually has gets high ratings. You have a lot of ho a hope for this movie to turn out to be very good. So, I'm definitely looking forward to seeing what that ends up being. It could end up being another bad horror film, but it could end up being a really good horror film too. So, definitely looking forward to checking out that. It's going to be a good day on June second because you got Spider Man and also the Boogeyman. So next up, we have Transformers Rise of the Beast, which is the second film in the Transformers series not to be directed by Michael Bay, which so far has been a pretty good thing because we got a great fir first movie without Michael Bay with Bumblebee, the spinoff film, which is a really fantastic movie. And I'm, I'm actually really looking forward to see what Transformers Rise of the Beast brings to the table. I mean, this is the first one without Michael Bay involved with, in the actual Transformers series. The director of this is Stephen Capel, who did Creed II. You have some great actors in here. Anthony Ramos from In the Heights. Dominique Fishback. Peter Cullen. Rob Perlman back as the voices. Uh, Pete Davidson's in here. Peter Dinklage. Michelle Yeoh. The, the trailers look pretty good. The action sequences actually look pretty fun. I have a lot of high hopes for this one. Hopefully it doesn't go the same way that the later Transformers sequels did. Like the Age of Extinction and the Last Night where they suck you, suck you in. And then they end up giving you just an overall piece of crap movie that's just unbearable to watch um i'm really looking forward to see what they do with this movie in particular transformers rise of the beast i'm really looking forward to that strays is one of those big question marks it's this comedy that's rated r it's got it's using kind of the same marketing campaign that good boys had a couple years ago where they literally have the r rating on the poster but the difference is good boys actually did kind of work and this movie this movie doesn't has a good idea i think uh, it's basically, you have Will Ferrell playing this Boston, t this terrier, who's abandoned in the streets by his owner, played by Will Forte, and he ends up teaming up with these other strays, basically to bite his nuts off. That's what they literally say in the trailer, and the fact that that's part of the marketing campaign, and it doesn't look like there's anything really unique about it, except for the fact that these dogs are talking, and talking as adults, and it's an R-rated comedy. I don't know how to feel about this one. I feel like it could really backfire big time. The only thing that really is giving me hope for it is that Phil Lord and Chris Miller are the producers on it, and they produce some pretty good movies. They made some great films. And the director of this is Josh Greenbaum, who also did Barb and Star Go to Vista Del Mar, which was one of the big surprises of 2021. So there are a lot of things to be really excited about with this movie, but I don't know. I feel like this could be a this could go one bad way, or it could go the other. It could end up being pretty good, but mostly it could end up being pretty bad too. So. Uh, Strays, that also comes out on June 9th. The 16th of June has a couple of movies of noteworthiness, including Wes Anderson's latest film, Asteroid City, which is written by Roman Coppola, features the all-star cast that these movies usually have. It's a Wes Anderson movie. I've liked a lot of his movies. I, I feel like I've, I've liked most of all of his movies in general, so I have no reason to believe that this movie ends up being bad whatsoever. Now, watch it be the first bad movie he's ever made, but, um... Two big movies come out that day as well, uh, including Disney Pixar's latest film, Elemental, which looks visually pleasing to look at, but the story elements, I'm not too sure about. This feels like a movie that dream it doesn't feel like one of Pixar's strongest films. You basically have a story where fire, water, land, and air residents live together. You have this woman, played by Leah Lewis, who meets this uh, go-with-the-flow guy, played by, I'm, I'm really going to butcher this name, Mamudu Athi. And they discover something elemental, how they actually have in common. The woman is a fire is from Firetown. The guy is made out of water. And it definitely has feels of Zootopia. But I do like some of the inspiration that the film is building on. This is, is according to the director, Peter Sowen, the, the film is being heavily influenced by stuff like Guess Who's Coming to Dinner, Moonstruck, Amelie. So there's definitely that positive going towards it. It looks nice overall, but I just can't get this feeling that the film kind of rips off its Zootopia a little bit with the design of the city. There weren't any jokes in this that really made me laugh overall, but then again, maybe they're just saving the best stuff for the movie itself. I mean, they're gonna, this is going to premiere in Cannes on Memorial Day weekend, so we should hear a lot more about this movie when that comes out. And um, it could go either way. It, it's, I'm more positive on this one just because I like the concept. I like the inspiration that they're using for this. 
But uh, this director, Peter Sohan, had made one other Pixar movie, which I was not the biggest fan of, The Good Dinosaur. I think that's one of the worst movies overall. It's basically Diet Land Before Time, but this movie does at least have some promise to it in terms of like the animation, some of the ideas that they have here. This could actually be out, be a pretty alright film. Um, uh, may, I just hope the trailers are showing us is aren't showing the best footage in this particular movie, and they're saving that for the actual film. Uh, the biggest new release of this weekend is going to be The Flash with uh, Ezra Miller once again playing The Flash once again. And this is a film that has a lot of controversy behind it, mostly because of the, the, behind, the trouble that Ezra Miller keeps getting himself into and the fact that this is part of the DCEU and this basically does not mean anything once James Gunn comes in and takes over. So uh it's going to be premiering in a couple of days at CinemaCon, so we'll hear some more about that coming up coming up pretty soon but this is another one just like with fast x that i'm just not really looking forward to i mean i mean there's stuff in here i should be getting excited about i mean michael keaton's back as batman for god's sake i mean michael keaton is an amazing actor i gotta defend the dude he's from pittsburgh i have to defend him from, he's from my hometown i mean but I mean, I want to see Michael Keaton return as Batman, but I want to see him return in a movie that doesn't have so much baggage behind it. This is a movie that has so much baggage behind it where this movie really needs to be amazing to even have any kind of significance going forward. And I just don't think it's going to have that, man. I mean, yeah, Ben Affleck's going to be back as Batman too, but just the stuff behind the scenes, the problems with the directors that kept coming in, the creative differences this movie has, and I feel like this movie is just ripping off Spider-Man No Way Home. It just feels like a movie that they don't really have a good idea for it, but they just saw No Way Home and said, we need to make our own No Way Home. And the last time they tried to copy the MCU, we got Batman v Superman out of it, and that movie ended up being absolutely horrible. So, uh, I don't know. Like, yeah, I'm excited to see that that uh, Michael Keaton's coming back as Batman. I'm excited to see that Ben Affleck is going to be back as Batman one more time, but... Nothing else about this movie really intrigues me at all. I mean, it could end up being pr much better than we expect it to be, but I severely doubt it, especially considering how the Warner Brothers studio under David Zaslav has just gone completely downhill and the way that they gave Ezra Miller a free pass to do whatever he wants, despite the fact that he's been the one that's causing the most trouble. But meanwhile, the Batgirl movie from last year gets canceled for no reason, which... Even, it gets canceled for no reason. The film is pretty much finished, and Warner Bros. is just like, no, we're never going to release it. Why? Why not? Why? It just, it makes no sense, and that's why I'm really not looking forward to this movie. I'm not looking forward to The Flash whatsoever. I know some people are. I know a lot of people actually are, but I don't know. Me, personally, I'm not really looking forward to this one. Elemental is probably the most excited I'm looking forward to a movie on this particular weekend. So That's June 16th. So next up, there's a big comedy opening up on June 23rd from Gene Stubnitsky, who directed Good Boys, which is No Hard Feelings. And uh, this is put, this is kind of supposed to be the big summer teen sex comedy for this for this year. You know, we used to get the, a lot of these with American Pie. Bad Teacher was one of the last notable ones. And uh, I'm really looking forward to this one, honestly, mostly because of Jennifer Lawrence. I mean, it's been a long time since I've seen a movie where she's been the lead in it. And... I mean, I'm she's my biggest crush, man. I love Jen I love me some Jennifer Lawrence. I'm really looking forward to this movie just on that factor alone. Plus, the premise overall seems like it could be pretty funny. You have a story where she plays an Uber driver who's facing bankruptcy and her car is repossessed, and she ends up accepting this Craigslist posting where her new employees are parents who have noticed their socially clueless but academically gifted teenage son is not interested in human reactions, dating women, or having sex. So basically, in exchange for a new car, she agrees to be the son's girlfriend to date her brains out, basically f her brains out, f his brains out, and help him enjoy adult adult, adult life. Toy boat, toy boat. So, yeah, it sounds like a comedy that could actually be pretty funny. I'm really looking forward to it, mostly because of Jennifer Lawrence, and also it's got a pretty good cast overall here too. And it's a it's a, these summer teen sex comedies actually end up being kind of good, like these. R-rated comedies. We don't usually get a lot of them recently. We haven't had a whole lot of them recently. So I'm definitely looking forward to see what they do with this particular film. It could end up being pretty bad too. But I am looking forward to it regardless. I'm looking forward to it. I may be one of the only ones that actually are looking forward to this particular film. So heading into 4th of July weekend, we have a couple of movies here. We don't know anything about Harold and the Purple Crayon yet. Which I could talk about that one, but I don't know if that's going to be sticking around or not. I think that one might get pushed back at some point because we haven't had a trailer for it yet. 
It's about a couple months away from getting released, but um, what is coming out that weekend is Ruby Gilman Teenage Kraken from DreamWorks Animation, which has a nice visual look to it. It looks visually pleasing. It's directed by the same guy that did The Croods, written by Pam Brady, who did South Park, the movie, and Hamlet 2. And it's got a good concept overall, but man, the trailers for this movie just really do not make me want to see this because it feels like they're giving away so much stuff in this movie. Like, they're giving a lot, a lot of the characters' backstories. There's a lot of exposition. There's, it looks like they're spoiling a lot of the big climax of the film. The movie could end up being pretty good. It's got a really good cast overall. Lana Condor, Tony Collette, Annie Murphy, Sam Richardson, uh, Jane Fonda, Will Forte. Just a phenomenal cast involved in this particular film. But, I don't know. That trailer really just gives so much away that I feel like they're giving away a lot of the movie here. I mean, you never know. This movie actually couldn't have end up being pretty good, and the trailer may not, may not be that great overall. Oh, but it does lead to a pretty enjoyable film. I like this idea that Annie, Annie Murphy plays this mermaid antagonist pretty much. Like, she's pretty much the villain of the movie, which, compared to what we see with The Little Mermaid, I like that we're getting two different sides of a mermaid. We get to see the positive fi the positive figure and then this negative fi figure within the same month. So, there are elements in here I'm definitely looking forward to checking out, but man, that trailer gave so much away. It kind of dings my anticipation for this movie. And uh, the big new release of that weekend has got to be Indiana Jones and the Dial of Dynasty, the fifth installment of the Indiana Jones series, the last film with Harrison Ford as Indiana Jones, uh, directed by James Mangold, the first person to take over the series since Steven Spielberg left the series. And it's the first one produced by Disney, too. And supposedly it's the only movie from the Indiana Jones series we're going to get. Yeah, supposedly Lucasfilms is basically saying that their focus in the future right now is going to be on Star Wars, and Indiana Jones is going to be that one-time thing that they do, kind of like with what they did with Willow, which the series that, the series that was just on Disney Plus recently is not coming back for another season. But uh, this is supposedly the, the, the only time that Indiana Jones will be used under Disney for the moment, even though this is also a Paramount production too, as you see on posters for the film. I'm really looking forward to this movie. This is probably my third highest anticipated film of the summer. But I don't feel like it's getting talked about as much. Like when Star Wars came back with The Force Awakens, the buzz on that was just amazing. And with Indiana Jones and the Dial of Dynasty, the buzz I don't think is as strong as I think it, they want it to be. Uh, but mostly I think it's because that people just don't understand that the Indiana Jones series is, to, is just as important as the Star Wars series. I mean, in terms of the Indiana Jones movies, The Last Crusade I think is the best one of the series followed by Raiders of the Lost Ark. Kingdom of the Crystal Skull is a pretty damn good movie. I don't care what anybody says. And Temple of Doom is a great movie too, but that's below Kingdom of the Crystal Skull. Temple of Doom still has a lot of fun moments in there, but that is easy. Temple of Doom is the worst, in quotation marks, film of that series, at least in my personal opinion. I know I'm wrong on that, but um, that's the power of freedom of speech, so you can say whatever you want. But, um, but yeah, Indiana Jones and the Dial of Dynasty, I'm real looking forward to see what they do with this movie, especially with a new direction, a new director involved in this, and seeing Harrison Ford one last time don the famous suit and the whip and all that. That looks like it's going to be a ton of fun. I think it's going to be a really good movie. I'm really looking forward to see what they do there. I just wish the buzz on it was getting a little bit better, but it feels like it's kind of under the radar for a lot of people compared to some of the other movies coming out this summer, so... I don't know. I mean, I really want to see it. It's probably one. Of, it's my third most anticipated movie of the summer. I'm definitely looking forward to checking it out. Indiana Jones and the Dial of Dynasty. That's going to be on June 30th. Starting off in July, we have Insidious, The Red Door on July 7th, which I think is the fifth installment of the series. The first one directed by Patrick Wilson, who's also back in this, along with Rose Byrne. And the Insidious movies have been kind of fun to watch. They are very creepy. They have a lot of great horror elements to them. But uh, I don't catch up with those movies as much as I do with some of the other horror franchises I catch up with, like The Purge or uh, Paranormal Activity. I thought the first one was a lot of fun and very creepy as well. So I'm definitely curious about this one. I have to rewatch all the other movies, though, before I can really get my interest in this movie. But the new one looks pretty interesting overall in from the new trailer that just popped up a couple of days ago. The Conjuring is the, the other f horror franchise I was thinking of. Uh, there's another comedy coming out on July 7th. Uh, Joyride, which is written by Cherry Chief of Palmadon from Family Guy and directed by Adele Lim. And uh, it seems like it's a movie that's going to be kind of the breakout comedy they're setting it up to be. Lionsgate's putting this out. It looks like a road trip comedy that's with um, 
that's basically centering around the the um uh, I can't remember what I'm thinking of. Hold on one second. It's looking like a comedy that's got a definite Asian flow. Like it definitely is trying to appeal to the audience that loved Crazy Rich Asians. Which Crazy Rich Asians was a pretty good movie overall. So I'm I'm actually kind of looking forward to it. I thought the trailer for it was a little hit and miss, but it's been getting some good reviews after it came out of South by Southwest. So there's a good chance that this might end up being one of the breakout surprise hits of the year. So I'm definitely curious about that one. That comes out on July 7th. Moving on to July 14th, we have Mission Impossible Dead Reckoning Part 1. And, of course, Tom Cruise just followed up one of his biggest successes last year with Top Gun Maverick with the next installment of one of his most profitable franchises, Mission Impossible. And the Mission Impossible movies have been very good. Ever since the third movie came out in 2006, they've gotten better and better and better with every film, with Mission Impossible Fallout being one of the best action films of all time. And I think Dead Reckoning Part 1 is setting itself up as the last these last this movie and the next movie are setting themselves up to be the last installments of the series and that's why they're being shot back to back so we got this one this year and then the next one comes out next summer i'm really looking forward to it especially after what happened with mission impossible fallout of course tom cruise does his all does his own stunts that's always a ton of fun just a strong cast back for this one uh you got Haley atwell coming into the play play Ving Rains is back, Simon Pegg, Rebecca Ferguson, Vanessa Kirby, you got Isai Morales, uh Palm Clement Clementi from um Mantis from Guardians of the Galaxy, uh Henry Cerny from the first movies coming back. You also have Rob Delaney, Carrie Elways, uh just a pretty good cast overall and the action sequences I'm sure are gonna be a ton of fun. I really am looking forward to this one a lot. Mission Impossible Dead Reckoning Part One. And then we get to July 21st, probably going to be the most fun weekend of the entire summer. And that is, of course, the summer where you have Christopher Nolan's Oppenheimer and Greta Gerwig's Barbie opening up on the exact same day. And that's going to be a fun weekend. You got two movies that look pretty impressive on on varying levels. Let's start with Oppenheimer. Christopher Nolan takes this movie to Universal instead of Warner Brothers. And uh, the trailers for this have been looking very, very cool looking, very visually stunning. It's got a great cast, Killian Murphy, Emily Blunt, Matt Damon, Robert Downey Jr., Rami Malik, Florence Pugh, Josh Hartnett, Kenneth Branagh, Dane DeHaan, David Krumholtz, Alden Ehrenreich, Matthew Modine. Just a great cast for this movie. It's a film that takes that follows the life of J. Robert Oppenheimer, who worked on the Manhattan Project and his contributions that led to the creation of the atomic bomb. It just looks like Christopher Nolan doing what Christopher Nolan does best. I really like Tenet. I know a lot of people weren't the biggest fans of it, but... That was the first movie I saw after the pandemic, so I kind of have a soft spot for it, having the theater to myself for that one. And uh, it definitely looks like a fun, a cool, a cool looking movie, I should say. The fun movie is probably going to be Barbie. This is a film that I remember watching the new trailer for this movie. I remember watching the new trailer. It just came out a couple of weeks ago, but I got to say, the first trailer for Bar the new trailers for Barbie look a t look like they're going to be a ton of fun. I saw the trailer for this. And my first thought really was basically that this movie has kind of the feel of like a mix between, it looks like a mix between of Grease meets Heathers meets the Lego movie meets Barb and Star go to Vista Del Mora meets Popeye, a little bit of Dick Tracy in terms of the visual style and Back to the Beach, one of the funnest guilty pleasures you can ever find. Look for this movie, Back to the Beach. It stars Frankie Avalon and Nefo Nicello, came out in the 80s. It's this really hilarious comedy satirizing the comedies that made them famous, the beach comedies. It's a really fantastic film. I can't recommend that one enough, but I see a lot of that in this movie, and it just looks like a ton of fun to me. Like, from the visual style alone, the casting for this movie looks amazing. Margot Robbie as Barbie, that's just pitch-perfect casting right there. Ryan Gosling as Ken looks like he's going to be a ton of fun. It has this huge ensemble supporting cast which includes uh, Simi Liu from Shang-Chi, Issa Rae, Kate McKinnon, Alexander Shipp, Rhea Perlman, Will Ferrell, Helen Mirren, Michael Sarah, just a brilliant cast overall. And Greta Gerwig is a really good director. A little woman, uh, Little Women she did uh, a couple years ago was very good. So was Lady Bird. She also did Frances Ha, and you also have Noah Baumbach, who's a very good script writer as well. I'm definitely looking forward to this one a lot. It's going to be a very fun weekend, but... Honestly, I think Barbie's going to be the most fun out of the two movies. I think Oppenheimer will be very good, too. But the movie that everybody will be talking about easily, probably, is going to be Barbie. It could be a ton of fun. It could be a movie that's kind of ahead of its time and have this cult following going forward. But I'm definitely looking forward to that weekend. July 21st is going to be a ton of fun. July comes to an end with Disney trying to do what they failed to do previously with The Haunted Mansion and make an actual good movie out of it. 
despite the fact that the one that came out 20 years ago had Eddie Murphy in it. That one was not a good film. But this movie definitely looks like it's a much better representation of the Haunted Mansion ride. This is, of course, another adaptation of the Disney theme park attraction. And they had a pretty good movie come out a couple years ago based on the Jungle Cruise movie. Uh, the Jungle Cruise attraction, I should say. The Jungle Cruise movie was a ton of fun. This looks like it could be pretty fun, too. It has Rosario Dawson in it, Lakeith Stanfield, Tiffany Haddish, Owen Wilson, Danny DeVito, Jamie Lee Curtis, Jarrett Leto, Dan Levy... Uh, Winona Ryder is also in here as well. The movie just has this really cool look to it that just feels right in line with the ride itself. I mean, the portrait corridor scene in the trailer just looked like a t looked like so, so much fun. It looks so creepy as you see the camera angle keeps going forward and the picture is just getting closer and closer. Like, that's a fun sequence right there. And it's got some good talent on board. Justin Simeon directed this movie. Uh, he also did Dear White People, which is actually a pretty good movie that came out a couple about 10 years ago. Uh, Katie Dipple is a good writer. She's written some good Parks and Recreation as well as uh, The Heat and Ghostbusters, the 2016 one, which I like Ghostbusters, um, the 2016 one. The Heat, not so much, but this looks like it could be a ton of fun. It has a nice mix of the ride along with a little bit of the humor that's in Ghost and What We Do in the Shadows, those TV shows that are very... And they're very good shows on TV, and... You can definitely tell there's a lot of influence in this particular film on that front as well. I'm really looking forward to seeing what they do here with this movie. I'm really looking forward to seeing what they do with this one. So that's The Haunted Mansion. That'll wrap up July. So as we enter August, we have Meg 2, The Trench. This is the sequel to The Meg, which as of this moment on April 23rd, we don't have a trailer for it yet. So we don't know if this is actually going to be out in time for August. But uh, if that does happen, I'm definitely looking forward to seeing that one. I like the first Meg a lot. But the big new release that comes out this weekend is, of course, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Mutant May Mayhem. This is the first, uh, second fully CG an fully animated Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles movie since TMNT in 2007. But this is the reboot of the series, which has Seth Rogen and Evan Goldberg producing it. It has a great cast involved with it. And the concept of having the Turtles be actually voiced by normal teenagers seems like a ton of fun. And the animation, once again, just looks phenomenal it looks like a really unique animation style here it looks incredible man and the trailer for this looked like a ton of fun the visuals look amazing the ninja turtle movies are usually a ton of fun i even like the michael bay produced ones honestly but um i'm definitely looking forward to see what they do with this new movie the teenage mutant ninja turtles mutant mayhem that's going to start off august and i'm definitely looking forward to checking that one out August 11th, the big new release is Gran Turismo, which we haven't had a trailer for as of yet. We only have a little behind-the-scenes thing they did. It's got Neil Blomkamp directing it, and despite the fact that he did District 9 and Elysium over 10 years ago, his career kind of has taken a little bit of a downfall as a director, but who knows? Maybe this could actually be something kind of amusing. I mean, Uncharted was a mixed bag of a film, but uh, until we actually see a full trailer for this, I can't really go into the, too much detail on that one, but... Um, the big movie I'm actually looking forward to is this one that comes out on the same day, The Last Voyage of the Demeter, which is a supernatural horror film based on a story from Bram Stoker's Dracula. And the director of this is Andre Overdahl, Overido, I think I'm pronouncing that name right, who also did Scary Stories to Tell in the Dark, which is a really good movie. And I love this trailer that came out for this movie recently. This looks like it could be a very engaging film. A very fun film overall. The story basically you have strange events befalling this doomed crew of a pirate ship, of the ship in general, as they attempt to survive the ocean voyage, stalked by each night by a merciless presence on board the ship. Where the Demeter, Demeter finally arrives off the shores of England, it's a wreck and there is no trace of the crew. And I just read the description off of here, but the trailer for this movie looks amazing. It looks like kind of a mix of The Thing meets Dracula, except this time it's taking place on the ship. This movie looks visually impressive. Impressive. It's a good time to, for these monster movies. I mean, we just had Renfield, which I've yet to see yet, but it does look pretty promising. We've had a lot of movies of this cal of this movie, to, these calibers taking these modern cla these classic characters and classic stories from from uh, literature in the past and bringing a modern setting to it. I'm really looking forward to see what they do with this particular film. The trailer for this looked pretty good. It's got Amblin Entertainment behind it, so they usually d put their name on good stuff. With, so. Overall, they put put the name on pretty good stuff. So I am definitely looking forward to checking this one out. Definitely look at the trailer for this one because it looks pretty amazing. And in terms of the big blockbusters, this is the last one that I noticed that we have a trailer for to talk about. And that is Blue Beetle, which was originally supposed to be a movie for HBO Max. But 
Of course, they put all those movies that were intended for HBO Max on the big screen. Some of them have been hits. Most is, some have been hits. Some have been misses. Evil Dead Rise right now is looking like a hit. Then, but then you have House Party, which was not a big hit. But I saw the trailer for this. It does look intriguing. It looks very interesting. It looks like it could be a ton of fun too. It definitely feels like something similar to the Shazam movies, which I really want to see those characters again, but I'm really doubtful that we will see another movie with them. But I do want to see them do more with those characters. And this movie looks like it could be a ton of fun. You basically have a story where you have this uh, college graduate who returns to his hometown. He's chosen to be the symbolic host to this scarab, which is an ancient alien biotechnical relic that grants him a powerful exoskeleton armor turning into the superhero Blue Beetle. And the transformation in the trailer looks like a ton of fun. It looks it, it looks like r terrifying, but at the same time, it looks pretty damn awesome. And you got a pretty good cast involved in here. You got Adrian Barzara as the grandmother. George Lopez actually has some funny lines in the trailer. Susan Sarandon's in here. The actor who plays this ki the kid, Exol the guy, I, I should say, Exolo Mariduena. Again, I'm probably mispronouncing that. He looks like he fits the role pretty well. I don't really know too much about the Blue Beetle character, but this definitely looks like something that if they're go is if it does become a success, I think they will find a way to bring him into the James Gunn DC universe they're planning, the James Gunn and Peter Safran Safran universe, I should say. But um trailer for it looked pretty good. Definitely looks like it has a lot of promise to it. So this could definitely be something that might actually end up being a lot of fun in the end. So I'm definitely looking forward to seeing what that movie looks like when it comes out in August. And that's pretty much the last major blockbuster that I'm looking forward to of the big blockbusters that are coming out this summer. There are definitely some little films that have my curiosity. Fool's Paradise, mostly because it's Charlie Day making his feature directorial debut and starring alongside Ray Liotta in one of his last film roles. And uh, I'm mostly going to see it because it's Charlie Day. And Charlie Day does not usually turn in a bad performance or usually is never bad in anything that he's in, at least in my opinion. Uh, on the same day, you got uh, Ben Affleck starring in Robert Rodriguez as Hypnotic. I don't really know too much about that one, but Robert Rodriguez and Ben Affleck working together could be a, a, very interesting. The remake of White Man Can't Jump comes out on Hulu on May 19th, which I'm very mixed on, honestly. The last movie this guy directed was How the House Party remake, and that was not very good. But it's written by Kenyon Barris from Blackish, and it has kind of the same, kind of an interesting concept to it. It really could go one way or the other, so I don't really know if that one's going to end up being good. But that comes out on Hulu on May 19th, so... Uh, about My Father, I just saw the trailer for this yesterday with the Super Mario Brothers movie. Sebastian Maniscalco, who I saw in Vince Vaughn's Wild West comedy show movie. I think he's a funny guy. I've seen him in a lot of other stuff, too. He's with Robert De Niro in here. This trailer is very mixed, but... I mean, I, I think it could go either way with this movie... We'll see how it turns out. I'm is I'm very mixed on it. It's not one I'm really looking to rush out to see when it comes out on Memorial Day weekend. Uh, Flaming Hot, Ava Longoria's movie about the I'm trying to remember what it was about. It was about the creation of the Flaming Hot Cheetos. That was one that can go either way. We just need to wait for a trailer for it, but it's going to be coming out on Hulu and Disney Plus on June 9th. So that one can go one way or the other. Uh, let's see what else we got here. Is there any other ones I'm missing here? I think uh, the only other one I see here is White Bird, which is a spinoff of the Wonder of the movie Wonder with Owen Wilson Julie, and Julia Roberts, which does not seem like a movie that feels like in the same vein as the original Wonder. I saw the trailer for this a long time ago, and I did not think it was actually related to the to the movie Wonder because Wonder is mostly is a coming of age movie, and then you have this war drama which supposedly takes place in the events of, the, of that same movie, and I don't know, man. I don't know if this is going to end up being good or not. I feel like this is a film that could really backfire big time when it's all said and done. And then the last movie of note here that I'm seeing here is Please Don't Destroy, which comes out on August 18th, which is from a universal comedy with Judd Apatow producing it, and you have a story where you have three childhood friends who live and work together, don't like where their lives are heading, and are setting off to go find this treasure which would be buried on a nearby mountain. We don't have any trailers for this movie as of now, so I definitely don't know too much about it, but uh, we'll wait to see what happens with that one when the new trailer comes out. So overall, that's all the movies of, of the summer of 2023. Like I said, my top five most anticipated movies. Uh, number one is obviously Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse. Two would be Guardians 3. Three would be Indiana Jones. Fourth, I think, is going to be Barbie. And fifth, I think, is Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Mutant Mayhem. Those are the ones that I'm definitely looking forward to the most. 
There are movies in here that I am looking forward to as well, but not as much as those other films do. Um, so that's pretty much all for this particular uh, podcast I wanted to do. I want to know your thoughts down below. I want to know what you guys think of the movies of summer 2023. Which ones are you looking forward to the most? Which ones are you looking forward to the least? Do you agree with my choices of which ones I'm looking forward to and not looking forward to? Let me know down in the comments below. Uh, that's going to wrap this up. Uh, thank you guys for, so much for watching this. And uh, there's actually going to be another one coming up next week. Depending, It's, it's mostly going to depend on what happens. We're going to be talking about the potential for a writer strike. And, uh, of course, we don't know what's going to happen. On May 1st, the Writers Guild of America essentially go, plans to go on strike if they don't get a brand new contract. with the is Because they're essentially a union. They're, go, they're planning on going on strike on May 1st assuming they don't get a new deal already and this is going to be is and a lot of people some of you may out there may not remember the 2007 and 2008 writer strike that happened this is pretty much going to be kind of similar to that so depending on whether or not a deal actually gets made going forward i'm going to do a post talking about what we can expect to see a podcast i should say about what can we can expect to see from a 2023 writer strike what does it means for movies in general tv what's the first thing you're going to notice that's not going to have the writers involved uh that's something i'm going to be trying i'm going to try to put together for next time uh hopefully th is with the hope that this actually does happen if it doesn't if there is a last minute reprieve before this even happens then this ends up being kind of pointless but um we will definitely get into that. We'll talk about that on the next episode. It's the next time we do this, which will be next week. So uh, stay tuned for that. But uh, other than that, thank you very much for watching this. Like I said, there's going to be a couple more of these test pilots throughout the summer. And then in the, se the fall, we're going to launch this as a weekly series. So uh, hopefully you guys will check it out. Thank you so much for watching, and I will see you next time. I'll leave a link to the playlist. And you can also check out the previous post I did about the Academy Awards. So want to check those out, go right ahead. Thank you guys so much for watching and listening. I'll see you guys next time. And until then, as always, take care.